Welcome to the upper digestive system. In this tutorial, we'll discuss the different cell types found in the gastric epithelium, focusing on their roles in digestion. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, and I'm the histology wizard. As mentioned previously, the pits and glands contain simple columnar epithelium, and there are many different types of cells found in the epithelium that perform important functions in the digestive process. There are four major cell types, and we'll walk through them using this cartoon as a guide as we discuss each different cell type. Lining the pits and in the glands are the mucus cells, the cells that create the mucus lining for the stomach and protect the tissues from acids and enzymes. There are two types. Surface mucus cells that are more columnar, line the pits and secrete mucin and bicarbonate, and mucus neck cells that are located in the pits and throughout the glands. These are fewer in number and they do secrete mucin, but their fluid is more acidic. Parietal cells are easily the most recognizable cell in the stomach. They are pyramidal or round large cells and often have two nuclei. They have a very characteristic flattened fried egg appearance. These cells are present among the mucus neck cells and in throughout the deeper areas of the glands. The cells secrete hydrochloric acid into the stomach lumen when stimulated in part by gastrin and histamine. Importantly, they also secrete an intrinsic factor, which as you will recall from our earlier videos, functions to protect vitamin B12 as it passes through the small intestine, allowing it to be absorbed in the ileum. Loss of these cells can lead to pernicious anemia. Parietal cells play several crucial roles in digestion, so we'll spend a few minutes discussing their functions, in particular the formation of acid. In the cell, carbonic anhydrase catalyzes water and carbon dioxide into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is then transported out basally, which helps keep the stomach mucosa a more neutral pH. Parietal cells have a hydrogen potassium ATPase on their luminal side, which pumps hydrogen ions into the lumen along with chloride through chloride channels. In the lumen, the hydrogen and chloride ions combine to form hydrochloric acid. These processes require a lot of energy, so the parietal cells have high numbers of mitochondria which can be seen in this electron micrograph and which give the cells their deep red color. Another striking feature of these cells in EM are the invaginations of the plasma membrane that form intracellular channels or caniculi, and these increase the surface area of the cell and help in the transport of ions. These microvilli or caniculi are a hallmark of an activated parietal cell. What precisely is the role of hydrochloric acid in the digestive tract? The low pH is critical for killing microorganisms, denaturing proteins, and inactivating enzymes in food that might harm tissues. In addition, the low pH activates pepsinogen, converting it to pepsin which will begin the process of protein digestion. The HCl can also be damaging to the mucosa and both HCl and pepsin are constantly degrading the mucus layer, which is constantly being replaced. The mucus layer then is critical for protecting the mucosa, but other factors such as bicarbonate, secreted by the surface mucus cells, and growth factors serve protective functions. Other factors act to damage the mucosa, such as the bacteria H. pylori, stress, alcohol, and NSAIDs. Normally these factors are in balance, but loss of a protective factor or increases in the damaging factors can tip the balance, allowing damage to the tissue. Many factors act via various signaling pathways to activate the hydrogen potassium ATPase. These include gastrin and histamine from enteroendocrine cells that we'll talk about shortly. These promote secretion. Prostaglandins inhibit secretion. The reason why NSAIDs are damaging is that they inhibit the prostaglandins that normally act to reduce acid, thus they actually increase acid production. Further parasympathetic stimulation via the vagus nerve can release acetylcholine that activates acetylcholine receptors either directly on parietal cells or on the cells that produce gastrin. These factors or signaling pathways can be inhibited and thus they are the targets of many drug therapies for hyperproduction of acid. Atropine, for example, acts to block the action of acetylcholine, while cimetidine or tagamate are antihistamines that block the ability of histamine to activate this H2 receptor. Another target is the, is the hydrogen potassium ADPase itself, which can be blocked by omeprazole, 
Prilosec. Use of these drugs can have side effects, which includes feedback effects on the cells that produce the factors that can stimulate parietal cells, and this has the result of causing hyperplasia of parietal cells and also some effects on the cells that produce gastrin. In some cases, this hyperactivation can lead to cancers. Let's dig a little deeper into the control of secretion. Control of about 60% of secretion is local or gastric, stimulated by distension of the stomach or signals that indicate digestion has begun, such as amino acids or small peptides. These stimuli most often affect local reflexes or local cells, including the cells that produce gastrin. The cephalic phase controls about 30% of secretion, and this is all done through the vagus nerve, which can be stimulated by distension or through interpretation of smell or taste or condition responses. The phases of secretory control also include an intestinal phase triggered by the presence of protein digestion products in the duodenum. So this is an intricate and complicated process with many parts, but you should just try to understand the big picture. The next major cell type in the stomach epithelium we'll discuss is the chief cell. These cells are found in the bottom of the glands, and like mucus and parietal cells, they secrete into the apical side of the cells, that is, into the lumen. Chief cells are more basophilic than parietal cells. They secrete pepsinogen, which is converted to pepsin in the lumen, and gastric lipase, which helps begin digestion of triacylglycerides. These are often but somewhat incorrectly called zymogenic cells because they produce a zymogen, pepsinogen. The h and &E section on the left shows the chief cells with their characteristic granules, while the right section highlights the different appearances of the chief and parietal cells. Here's a different h and &E stain section that accentuates the differences in color between the parietal cells and the basophilic chief cells. There are also a number of enteroendocrine cells in the gastric epithelium. These cells are part of the diffuse neuroendocrine system and are also sometimes referred to as APUD cells. There are a number of products produced by gastric cells, including gastrin, histamine, somatostatin, serotonin, and ghrelin. These hormones regulate peristalsis, tract motility, secretion of digestive enzymes, water and electrolytes, as well as satiety. You don't need to know exactly which cells produce what hormone, but you should know the products. One important difference in the activity of enteroendocrine cells is that they secrete basally into the blood, in contrast to the other cells which secrete apically into the lumen. By definition, endocrine cells regulate tissues by means of secretion into blood, and these cells act in the exact same way. The products can act locally via paracrine means or systemically via endocrine means. G cells are one example of an enteroendocrine cell. As we've talked about before, these cells secrete gastrin. They are normally found in the glands of the pylorus. And as seen in this section of pyloric antrum, stained for gastrin, they are secreting into the blood and they act on parietal cells primarily in the body and fundus of the stomach. This image reviews the difference between the oxyntic glands of the body and the fundus and the pyloric glands and gives some information about the different cell types. Finally, we come to the stem cells of the gastric glands. There's high turnover of gastric epithelial cells, particularly of those surface mucus cells, which are constantly under damage. And all the cell types are regenerated from the same stem cells. These stem cells for all the epithelial cells that line the glands, pits, and stomach lumen are found in a narrow segment or isthmus between each pit and gland, and it's marked here by the green star. That's it for the cells of the gastric epithelium. With this, we've now completed the histology of the upper digestive tract. In the next part of our overall series on the digestive system, we'll discuss the histology and special features and functions of the intestines. If you're liking these videos, please give them a thumbs up, and thanks for stopping by.